Okay, a warm welcome to all the participants. Uh, today I am going to speak about new worlds in the universe. This will be the last talk, talk in this series, as you know. And uh, so in this lecture, we'll be talking about the new worlds in the universe, which means that we'll be talking about extrasolar planets, how to detect them, what are the difficulties, what is the requirement, why do we need this, what is the statistics, and so on. Now this is our solar system planets, as you know, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. These are the eight planets, designated planets. There are also eight dwarf planets, Ceres, Pluto, Umia, Makamake, and Aries. This is our solar system. This is our family. Now, just to put the scorecard, the extrasolar planets, which have been so far discovered, and confirmed as planets revolving around their host stars, they are about 3,925, 3,925, of which about 1,700 or so are Neptune-like, the size of the Neptune. Neptune is about 17, 18 times as massive as the Earth. Then Jupiter-like or Saturn-like gas giants are about 1,214. Super Earths, much larger than, the more massive than the Earth, are about 878, and Earth-likes are about 156. Unknown is about 12, that totals to 3925. And the stars with planets, stars for which the planets have been discovered are 2926. Here. So some stars do have multiple planets like our sun. Now the uncom unconfirmed planet candidates are about 3,389. These are mostly discovered by the transit method, which I will describe a little later, by the satellites, and they do require confirmation. Now the early discoveries of exoplanets, they started almost 1983-84 by the launch of the infrared astronomical satellite IRAS, which discovered several stars, which are called Vega-like stars, Vega being the typical star that has this kind of a disk. They have discovered, discovered around these stars large infrared excesses. Now, there are only four bands in IRAS satellites in the far infrared, from 12 to about 100 micrometers. With these four bands, they have modeled the infrared excess and very boldly declared that these stars, like Vega, they have large dust particles, more than 10 micrometers in size. So these are termed as the planetesimals. This is a very exciting discovery. And in 1984, Campbell, Walker, and Young of Canada, they have come up with a discovery of a planet around Gamma Cephei, the size of which is a very large size actually, 1.6 times the Jupiter mass. And from the star, it is situated at two astronomical units. Jupiter is five astronomical units, the periodicity of about 900 days. And very surprising discovery was by this radio astronomers, Wolfshawn and Freil, who have discovered planets around pulsars of all the types of stars that we have, pulsars. And these are millisecond pulsars, 6.2 millisecond, and uh, two kilo light years, 2000 light years away. And with masses, these planetary masses are about a few times the mass of the Earth, situated very close to the star, uh, close to pulsar about 0.47 AU and 0.36 AU. Pulsar itself, as you know, is a, a, a few kilometers across, about 10 kilometers across. Very highly dense object. And these are the periodicities. 
But traditionally, in 1995, the Swiss astronomers got the credit for discovering the planet. This is the first discovery they term. 51 Pegasi is a sun-like star. A planet of mass 1 Jupiter was discovered very, very close to the star, 0 0.05 astronomical units. So it's called hot Jupiter because the closer the planet is to the star, the hotter it will get. Now, since that time, a watershed of new exciting area had opened up in observational astronomy. Now, what are the basic issues in exoplanet study? So we want to know actually the physics of plan formation of planets and physics of evolution of planets. How frequent are the exoplanets around stars? How do planets vary in properties with the properties of the parent star, mass, spectral type, composition, age, binarity, and so on? Are the exoplanets like our, they are similar to our solar system objects? Do they have multiple planets? Yes, we they have mass, radius, density, albedo, orbital parameters, whether they are inclined, and so on. So all these detailed information one would like to know to get a good statistics to finally answer the question of how the planets form from the debris disks. Do exoplanets have, have atmospheres is the next question that one would like to ask. What are they like? Are they habitable? We will define that habitability a little later. Is there finally, is there life beyond the solar system? Now just a recapitulation, very low mass stars brown dwarfs and planets, the proton-proton chain hydrogen burning reactions at the cores will occur only for the masses more than 0 0.08 solar masses and the brown dwarfs fall less than that mass range. Okay, so between, so finally without going into all these details which I have already covered, some uh, phase of core helium burning takes place in the brown dwarfs but in planets it is purely gravitational energy. Okay, now the stars therefore are mass having masses more than 0 0.08 solar masses so that they can start the uh, hydrogen burning reactions at the cores. Brown dwarfs are failed stars between these two masses 0 0.015 solar masses to 0 0.08 solar masses and planets are less than 0 0.015 solar masses which is about 15 times mass of the Jupiter. Now, we have said in the earlier, just to recapitulate, in the pre-main sequence stage, we do have these debris disks like that with sufficient mass, a very small fraction of solar mass, the mass that is there in the disks here. So with this mass, planets in principle can be formed. So the planets we believe form from the debris disks of such stars, such uh, pre-main sequence stars. Now there are two scenarios under which the stars can form. One is accretion onto this planetesimal sort of small, very small dust particles which have been discovered in the case of Vega-like stars. So this is called the core accretion. So we have some, some of these cores, very small cores, not like the stellar cores. These are much smaller. Onto these cores, the matter is accreted from the debris disk. And the, and the planets can form. Okay, now the giant planets, can they form for the low mass stars is one question because in the low mass stars, we don't have sufficient mass available in the debris disks. So it's difficult to form such giant planets. That means uh, masses of planets close to that of Jupiter, difficult to form for the low mass stars. Do we see that? Other mechanism is gravitational instability. That means in the debris disk, there will be inhomogeneities. There will be higher density regions, low density regions and all. So by perturbation, these high density regions can collapse to form the planets. This particularly doesn't require whether it is a low mass or high mass. So even in low mass case, large planets, giant planets can form in this kind of a scenario. Now, the crucial, therefore, the crucial question is that occurrence of planets 
giant planets similar to the mass of the Jupiter should we see in the low mass stars? Occurrence of giant planets close to the star which we have already seen in the case of the first discovery 51 Pegasi. It's very close 0 0.05 astronomical units. So why do they occur very close to them? So what is the origin of the hot Jupiters? Okay. These are the questions that one would ask and also what is the interaction of planets with the disk? How do they interact and what is the result of that one? For instance, the occurrence of giant planets, planets very close to the star, is it a result of interaction of the planets with the disk and therefore the planets lose their energy and fall inside the inner orbits. Now just let us understand now the mechanics of this. We have a star here, this white blob, this is the planet, okay, show, shown by the stellar light. So this is, that's why this is luminous but not the other side, okay. Now this, there is a center of mass, ms and mp, masses of the star and planet and you have a center of mass around which both these objects, both the star and the planet would rotate. The star will make a very, very small circle around the center of mass and this one will make a larger circle around the center of mass again. This will have a larger velocity which we cannot detect. This will have a very, very small velocity. So this is the story. So the, if the observer is here, okay, right in this plane, then we can, uh, he can see very clearly what is happening here. If the observer is face on, that means if the situation is face on to the observer, then also he will see the actual orbit all the way. But the velocity component will be zero towards him. Okay, so if, if you were to find out the velocity, okay, of the star here, the observer has to be very nicely positioned in this plane. At John, he should see. Then the velocity component towards him and away from him, towards him and away from him will be maximum. If he sees it phase on, phase on, then they will be zero, the components will be zero. So that is one. And there are two unknowns here. This is the plane of the sky and this plane of the orbit. So as I said, if the orbital inclination is zero, you don't see this situation, but if the orbital inclination is 90 degrees, then it's better situation for us. One more thing unknown is the orbital eccentricity. Eccentricity, we have some kind of a handle to find out, but inclination is very difficult to find. So all our results are error prone to that extent that we don't know the inclination angle. Now this is simple mechanics, Kepler and Newton. This is the Kepler's second law. Period square is uh, uh, proportional to the separation cubed here. So P square is proportional to A cubed here. And this is the sum of these two masses here. So P square is 4 pi square A cubed divided by G times ms plus mp. So the velocity of the planet is here, which we cannot measure, I have said. And the mass of the planet and the velocity of uh, mass of the uh, planet and the mass of the star are related to the velocities in this fashion. And similarly, the separation is uh, related to this. mp times ap is equal to ms times as moments, where A is equal to AS, AS plus AP. AS is very, very small. It is AP which is very large, okay, depending on the mass of the planet. Now, what are the observables here in this? This is a very simple mechanics from the Kepler and Newton formulation. One can directly image such systems, okay. Then the period and separation can be obtained that is a very easily observable quantities. And then there are small, very small dynamical perturbations in the velocity, the stellar velocity here, position angle because star is now wobbling like this, star makes a nice wobble here like that positionally and the time of arrival. While it is wobbling, 
like this suppose observer is now face on towards me then what happens is when these two situation under these two situations the light travel time here will be different okay let me put it this way observer when it is here and when it is there there is a small difference in the time that the light wave travels from when when it is here it will take some certain time when it is here it will take certain time okay now what happens is that that when you have a, a signal that can be actually recorded okay constantly like a spectral line like a like something then we can find out a wobble in the time of arrival of the signal and that is possible only in the case of pulsars because pulsars emit pulses at very very accurate regular intervals 1 in 10 to the power of 15 also their accuracy they are sometimes better they are actually better than the atomic block clocks so they send these pulses and in the arrival time of these pulses there will be a little wobble because of this wobble in the position of this one. that can be observed so the pulsar planets were observed using this timing technique time of arrival technique okay so as divided by c so that much difference will be there and then when the planet passes around the star across the star like this okay when the observer is here when a planet is going around like that at this particular point at this particular region they actually the planet is crossing over the star so it will dim the light for some time that's called the transit so you can observe the transit but the probability of the transit is the uh, stellar radius and the distance between the star and the planet if they are very close then there is higher probability now the another important uh, thing is that the planet and the sun in terms of flux or the brightness there is a vast difference orders of magnitude 10 to the power of 9 10 to the power of 12 difference between these two so it's very very difficult to observe the planet in the light of a star so for instance here i have given for the hot jupiter it is so many six orders of magnitude difference for the earth and for the actual jupiter nine orders 12 orders and so on but if you have a m star such a somewhat colder star then situation is a little better and the situation is better also in the longer wavelengths okay like that so several uh, planets solar system planets are given here in relation to sun and in relation to m, m type star the low mass star so due, due to this star's dominating brightness and also the closeness of the star to the planet or the planet's closeness to the star it is very difficult to detect a planet by direct imaging that's one thing but still attempts have been made and all these planets which are discovered here b c and d are the planets around this particular star which is designated as hr 8799 they are quite actually they are not very close because as i have said the telescope no matter what however big its radius the diameter is or the size is the atmosphere will allow only one arc second sort of spatial resolutions but these are observed by using special techniques by masking first of all by masking the star itself okay so that the light doesn't affect the discovery of these planets then you can see clearly the other the environment okay so that's what they have used and the masses of these uh, planets newly discovered planets are 10 and uh, 10 10 and 7 jupiter masses okay so this is another direct imaging but the observations by using the direct imaging are very very few and far between so the indirect techniques for detecting the exoplanets will utilize these perturbations here dynamical perturbations the velocity in the position angle time of arrival i have already said and also the transit so one is the variability in the star's position the, the star's position is wobbling like, like this position wobble so that is called the astrometry 
it has to be very very accurate much smaller than a mil uh, uh, an arc second it should be in the milli arc second or even micro arc second range so which is extremely difficult observation and the variability in the star's radial velocity is somewhat possible also it is not it is not that easy okay so the star because the star's velocity i will tell you the numbers actually is very very small amount and that wobbles with that small amount around the center of mass so this doppler wobble you have to observe by using high resolution spectroscopy very stable precision spectroscopy is what is required and the vari variability in the time of arrival of light uh, especially using the pulsars which are very regularly accurately giving this pulses and if there is any wobble in those pulses in the time of arrival wobble then you will come to know that there is yes there is a planet around that and then the transit photometry so as the planet goes in front of the star the light dips light from the star dips reduces for some time that's called the transit photometry also the micro lensing technique which i'll briefly tell a little later that also has been used so these are the indirect techniques for detecting exoplanets now what are the deliverable del deliverables here but most of the techniques period is available usually the host star values are known host star parameters are known its temperature mass radius are with good act accuracy we know that and direct imaging gives the planet mass knowing the separation velocity perturbation gives the mass again position perturbation again gives the mass knowing the separation timing of the perturbation that is a pulsar thing that also gives the mass transit met method gives planet radius and eccentricity we can find out fairly accurately from the velocity curves or the transit light curves by looking at it whether it is sinusoidal nice sinusoidal variation or little skewed variation in the, in the case of uh, high eccentric objects you get a skewed velocity i will show you that pattern so what is unknown quantity really is the orbital inclination so you get a lower limit for the mass now the photometry of transits of planets involves measurement of periodic dimming of the starlight caused by the planet transiting or occulting in front of it it passes so for some time the light is dimmed now the limitations are that this uh, proper alignment has to be there as i said the inclination should be close to about 90 degrees okay 90 degrees is perfect but about nearby 90 degrees is also okay and requires mass determination from other techniques because it will only at best give you the radius by modeling of course you can also get a uh, handle on the mass but that will be very inaccurate so you require other observations also only in nearby planets near to the star they can be observed from this because of the probability condition rs divided by a a being the separation so smaller the separation higher the probability now just a illustration here so this is the star the blue circle here and this red smaller circle is the planet which is going around that so when the planet is going across this star here the light this is your measurement here this is starlight when the planet is outside this and as the planet enters the uh, that means in, in front of the uh, star then the light dims like that and then goes out again okay now if you actually uh, the radius of the planet radius of star you have models so you know that let us say and rp can be found out if you accurately determine the time between this event and this year when the when the planet is completely inside and when the planet goes out yeah i'll give you the scorecard i have given the scorecard in the beginning the large number of planets 1000 4000 or more even uh, there are already 4000 which are confirmed planets for uh, around 3000 stars and there are more stars more uh, events which have to be confirmed they they are about another 3000 or so okay so that is the score card so far and in the habitable zone which which we will come to the habitable zone the planet discoveries are only a few maybe a few tens or so in the habitable zone so we'll go a little uh, more deeper into that 
So this is how from the uh, transit of the planets, you can get an idea, fairly good idea, accurate idea on the radius of the planet, which is a very important parameter. There is a Kepler mission, uh, almost six years or more, it has done its uh, job. It's a 0.95 meter. It has been finally retired in October last year, 2018. And uh, most of the transit discoveries have been made by Kepler mission, thousands of them. So as I've said here, more than 4,000 or so candidates have been discovered by the Kepler mission. Okay, so it actually searches as a satellite goes around the earth, it actually takes uh, periodically so many pictures and these pictures are analyzed, these images are analyzed to find out if there is any change in the uh, light of the star. Now the microlensing effect is another very interesting technique, but the number of uh, objects, number of planets discovered by using this technique are very, very few and far between, as I have said. So this is the observer over here. I'll briefly explain this one. And this is the uh, star, uh, which is uh, probably, which has probably a planet, which you want to find out. Now, what you need is that a far off star exactly in the line of sight of this. So this star, the lens, let us call it lens star, and this far off star, should be exactly in the same line of sight to the observer. Then in that situation, what happens is that the light rays bend according to the general theory of relativity of Einstein. This has been uh, verified long back in 1919 by Eddington by doing this experiment during the solar eclipse time when that was a very exciting times when the gravity, uh, uh, general relativity has been proposed by Einstein. So these are the verification tests that have been made. So similar to that, if this is star, the sending light here, so it gets bent and come here. So you, you feel as if the light is coming from here. So you get a ring of brightness here. So since you cannot resolve because of the very large distances, very uh, sub arc second uh, uh, the angles, you will only see brightness, a sudden increase in the brightness when you observe this star, okay? So this ring here, the ring radius is given by this one that depends on the mass of the lens here, and the distance to the lens here. So this is called the Einstein radius. Now, so when you make the observation of this system, okay, then there is nothing here, there is no uh, alignment here. So as the alignment is happening, the light curve, you get a magnification of the light, goes up like that, up, 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 reaches maximum, which is about almost 1000 times brighter, the normal case, then comes down when the alignment is gone. Okay, and this time here is a few weeks, it's not just one day or one hour or something like that, it's a few weeks. So this whole event lasts for a few weeks, it's a very difficult observation. So, but in addition to the star, suppose you put a planet around the star, around the lensing star. This is here, planet. Then the planet also gets into the alignment with the far off star and it gives its own small spike here. Okay, that's what happens. So you have to get you have to observe this small spike here. So you can imagine now what are the accuracies, what are the, uh, how precise your measurement should be. Now this is one example here by a program called Optical Gravitational Lensing Experiment, OGLE, O-G-L-E. So this is a star for which the planet has been discovered. This is a light curve similar to this, which I have explained. This is the small spike probably, and it is actually due to the planet. It's a very interesting technique. And if you know certain these distances and all, it is very nice, very accurately you can determine the mass of the planet. It is not repeatable. Once the event is over, the same star you cannot repeat again, is gone, okay? And 
we require large number of stars anyway to monitor and get the statistics so this method as such is not very useful method but it's a very very interesting and very extremely inter uh, interesting and extremely important method not only uh, to to prove uh, einstein's uh, general relativity but also actually to make this observation because very it is a, a combined work of several astronomers situated all over the globe because you have to observe this star without losing the uh, connection for several weeks right so all all in uh, all time zones there should be some observer observing this star so this is a combination of such observations okay several weeks so it's a fantastic experiment but as i have said this is marred with the distance uncertainties which will now crop up into the mass determination and also it is not repeatable so the spectroscopy is uh, another technique which is again fairly successfully used after the transit so you have a large number of transit observations and you have some good number of doppler wobble observations that is spectro using spectroscopy okay now as i said if the the, the star will make a nice sinusoidal pattern here as you observe with time okay now depending upon the eccentricity eccentricity is zero in this case and if it is eccentricity is non zero then you get this sort of a skewed profile when you are observing so this is non zero eccentricity fairly large eccentricity so basically a spectrometer will have a source here in in our case it's a star the light comes it is passed through a disperser and then it's collimated and sent to a detector and you get a series of lines and you will see how each line if the planet is there or a star the star will make small wobble like this in this so the the spectral lines will be wobbling periodically like that that's what you have to observe with time please notice here yeah there is a question is there any minimum mass for the planet actually there is no minimum mass in the in the case of the microlensing effect very very small even asteroids can be detected provided of course your photometry is very accurate and all this uh, most of the planets discovered using the microlensing effect are a few at the mass planet very small mass yes it is there is no limit as such so basically you have to notice that what are the velocities that we are talking about in the case of jupiter that means you have only the sun and jupiter this system a star and a planet and then the star that's in this case the sun having only jupiter it will make a nice small wobble with a 12 meter per second so from here to here it will be about 12 meters per second meters per second please notice in astronomy it's very very difficult and for the case of earth that means you have only sun and the earth system then it is 9 cm per second very small values now sir if you use a spectroscopic technique so let us say the star wobbles with a rotational velocity of 3 meters per second now the spectrograph should have a resolving power in order to detect such small values which is equal to the resolving power is lambda divided by delta lambda small delta lambda is your spectral element with which you actually sample now that is equal to velocity of light divided by delta v that small delta v delta v is now this 3 meters per second so if you put in the numbers for a wavelength of 600 nanometers you get resolving power of 10 to the power of 8 very 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 large resolving power now what are the currently available spectrographs in the visible region they have only about 10 to the power of 5 resolving power so it is extremely difficult and you cannot reach such numbers if you now put the earth in the centimeters per second it will be 10 to the power of 10 or so so it is not that that you need a very high resolution high resolution in the sense this much spectrograph but you use actually a statistical method 
to detect these planets. But of course, you should have large enough resolving powers around this. Now, this is what we do. So, we take the spectra in very large wavelength regime in the visible wavelengths, fairly large resolving powers, 70,000 or even 100,000, and several hundreds, sometimes a few couple of thousand lines will, will identify, and they are cross correlated with a mask for this type of a star because you should know the type of the star. Now, all these lines should show periodic variations. Okay, so the larger the number, then your precision will increase. It's almost number of lines, suppose, is n, capital N, then the root of n will give you the precision with which you can observe the radial velocity. So, the Doppler wobble technique, the photon noise limited radial velocity precision is given by this one. So, this uh, constant times uh, in the denominator, you have the signal strength here, root of that, and the wavelength coverage because that determines the number of lines that you have. Okay, that is the delta lambda here, root of delta lambda, and R is the resolving power. Okay, so the signal strength has to be large, the wavelength coverage has to be large, and the resolving power also has to be large. Okay, then statistically, as you see, the pre precision will increase. Precision is basically is not accuracy. Precision is the repeatability. How how you, how we are able to repeat a particular observation? To what extent you can repeat? To, to what error you can repeat? That is the precision. Accuracy is actually how how much you get into the actual value. Suppose you know that the light velocity is so much. You measure, make a measurement. Can you reach that particular value is your accuracy? With what accuracy you reach this value? Precision is the repeatability. Okay, every time you do the experiment, will you reach the same value? That is the precision. So this has to be precise. And therefore, that, that uh, depends upon all these three quantities. That's what it is. Now, these are some radial velocity observations here. This is a very nice sinusoidal curve. So, eccentricity is, uh, uh, can you read this? It's about 0 0.01, very small. Okay, for this star, 51 Pegasi, this is actually the uh, discovery star. It's a G3 type star, sun like star, the uh, main sequence star. Uh, it's a this distance, 15.4 parsec. And this is another star. Uh, M4 tiles, a low mass star compared to the uh, G3, and this skewed uh, velocity curve you can see. This is skewed. So that means, therefore, the the eccentricity is non-zero. I think it's 0.26. I can't read that, but I think you can see 0.26 is the eccentricity compared to this 0 0.01, which is very fairly nice sinusoidal here. So the best technique for finding there is a question. So the best techniques for finding the exoplanets, that means best not only in terms of the accuracies and all, but also it should be successfully observable. That means you should be able to get more and more candidates, large number of candidates. That is the transit, of course. Transit will give you a large number of observations and candidates, like Kepler satellite has given thousands of candidates. They have to be now confirmed by using the radial velocity technique, another technique that is fairly uh, uh, easily you can use because you can build such spectrometers, it is not difficult, and use these spectrometers on a fairly large telescopes and find out the velocity curves and you will actually augment, complement the results from the transit observations. So the transit observations together with the radial velocity observations, they are the best tool to find out the characteristic features of the planets. That is the best way to, to do that. Other techniques there, as I said, very few available. The astrometry is, is still not yet taken off. Okay, that means the wobble in the position that requires large accuracies. Whereas lensing is only very few uh, we are getting. It is not repeatable. That is the main problem, main drawback. 
and direct imaging is only giving you very far off planets. So these two are the best techniques, transit observation and the radial velocity observation. Now, uh, so this will actually prove the point here. So, so far the exoplanets that have been discovered, the few thousands which I have projected in the very uh, second or third slide, by transit alone, we have 77% is accounted by the transit. Radial velocity is about 20%. The rest follows here. So micro lensing actually contributed about 2%. Still, they are going on. As I said, this Augle experiment, optical gravitational lensing experiment, it is going on. Uh, they are very excited about this one. So they, they do this. The important uh, thing about this, the far off planets. If you have a star here, a planet is very far off. This is the best technique to use the micro lensing. But you need that alignment. You have to wait for that because the alignments are not even predictable. So uh, that is the difficulty with this. Okay, so the, to estimate both the mass and the radius of the exoplanets, okay, that will give you the average density. That is very important. Now the exoplanet searches missions I have given here: Corot, 30, 30 centimeter telescope in 2007; Kepler, fantastic job it has done for uh, more than six years. It got retired last year and um, NASA transiting exoplanet survey satellite test which was launched last year it started giving the uh, observations uh, transit observations it is supposed to monitor more than 200,000 stars so there will be a flood of data now coming forth in the in the future in a few years time then uh, this uh, Cheops which is a European satellite ESA ESA uh, that will go uh, uh, probably the first part of this year this is a European characterizing exoplanet satellites uh, and then European planetary transits uh, plateau is there 2024 it's planned it's also a transit photometry as I said transit will give you a number of candidates which have to be verified by the radial velocity technique which can be done from the ground now this is a spectroscopic uh, satellite Hubble and Spitzer and they have done also their bit and on this future James Webb uh, Space Telescope is uh, look, looking for we are looking forward to that and then we have also the White Field Infrared Space Telescope in future for spectroscopy for doing the radial velocity measurements. So the future is you have uh, tremendous accuracies you require micro arc seconds 10 to the power of minus 6 arc second. Okay. These are all satellite observations. They should be. Photometry, you, you need one part in million, 10 to the power of minus six magnitudes. We require that, that kind of accuracies. And in spectroscopy, one centimeter per second. Now, ground based facilities are so many uh, for doing this uh, uh, complementary augment, augmentation operations, 10 meter telescope, Keck. Very large telescope interferometry, eight, eight meters, uh, binocular telescopes, uh, several existing and future ground based telescopes are also using this one. 30 meter telescope, which is coming up by the, in, uh, by the California Institute of Technology, and the European extremely large telescope by the European community, 45 meters. These are also looking, we are looking forward to for giving great results. Now, existing uh, spectrographs are Corali, Harps, LOD. These are all put at the focus eye of uh, very large telescope, three or four meter telescopes, all these three, especially Harps by the Europeans for the radial velocity. Okay. Now, if you plot these planets below about 15 or so, uh, Earth, earth masses here. This is earth mass here. I can't see it here because very, I am seeing only a small picture. And plotted, uh, so this at the radius here below about 4 radii, 4, 5, 4 I think. Below that earth radius, so this earth radii versus the mass in terms of earth units. This is earth units radius and this is the mass in earth units. So, Earth itself, you can see here this one. This one is Earth. 
okay uh, venus and so on now these lines here you please notice there is so much uh, data here so don't worry about that but this line here will tell you the solid uh, density okay so all these planets between these two are solid planets as you go up 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 like that this one is the gaseous planet limit so the planets which are here between these two are gaseous planets okay, so this is a model done on the on the densities because you know both the mass and the radius therefore density models it, it's it depend it is just an idea to give you an idea okay and the color coding is uh, the flux in terms of earth flux okay from one here to about 4000 times the earth here and this is the radius uh, this is the temperature of the planet from 3000 300 degrees such as earth to about 2200 very hot planets that's the information here Yeah, I will. Uh, there is a question uh, as to what what we are doing in India. So I will give you that answer in a little while from now. Okay, please hold on. So this is the rocky planet and this is a ga uh, gaseous planet. So uh, the idea here is that if the radii are about less than two Earth radii, then most likely they are rocky planets, and otherwise they are gaseous planets. And uh, the exoplanet mass versus orbital distance is plotted here. So you can see various techniques here. Do Doppler techniques is blue colored dots here. So you can, you can see a lot of large number of them. Closer to the star as well as far off from the star. Transit observations are all very close to the star as I have said because of the probability. Necessarily they are very close to the star. So large number. Here. Okay. And the microlensing, these are yellow dots here. Fairly good number, but not reaching this kind of numbers, Doppler or transit. And some imaging here, they're very far off. That is statistics. Now there are revealing statistics from the Kepler. It's unlikely that 10% only that sun-like stars host Jupiter-like giant planets. Okay, with periods shorter than a few years. That is very close to the uh, low mass stars. Uh, Sun-Jupiter case, the period is 11.8 years and it's quite likely, probability is more than about 50% that sun-like stars host a system of planets, small planets with period less than one year. Giant planets have large range of eccentricity, mean is 0.2, they're eccentric mainly. Smaller planets have lower eccentricity, mean is 0.1. Small planets have orbital alignment within a few degrees. Occasionally, giant planets have larger inclinations. Orbital planes of close-in giant planets in hot stars are misaligned. So this is some stats. Don't worry about that. And this is another uh, view graph again with some more statistics. Kepler observations show that every fifth star hosts at least one rocky, rocky planet in the habitable zone. Someone asked uh, how many habitable zone planets have been discovered. This is, a, this is the kind of statistics we are expecting. So there will be a large number of habitable zone planets. We'll define the habitable zone in a, in a short while. So the Kepler has discovered massive rocky planets, 10 times the mass of the Earth, and gas planets to have masses two times. So two extremes are also possible here. Okay, two Earth masses, but it's a gaseous planet. Okay. And very massive uh, planet, uh, 10 times uh, the mass of the Earth, but they're rocky planets like that. Mass of planet seems to be a weak constraint on the rocky nature. Radius is a better constraint, which I have shown in the other view graph. Below about two solar uh, Earth, Earth radius, it could be rocky. So if only either mass or radius is available, then radius is a better indicator for the rocky nature of the planet. And therefore, both radius and mass have to be observed. So here is where the importance of the radial velocity observations, that means spectrographs, is, is there, right? That is the importance. So we cannot overemphasize the importance of the spectrographs, very precise spectrographs. Some unexpected results, I'll just uh, quickly uh, skip this. Planets around pulsars because we don't know how these planets have formed from the because supernova is the 
the thing that has gone up from the massive star and the core has gone to the pulsar and where from the planet has collected the matter and formed. That's a very big question. How do you form stars around uh, planets around pulsars? Obviously, it has to be before the supernova blast. Uh, uh, after the supernova, sorry, after the supernova blast. Right? Because otherwise, it, it cannot survive that energy, release of that energy. So, where is the matter and how did it form? That These are the questions Okay, that one would ask. The giant planets within 0.1 astronomical unit, how did they actually get so close? Is it because of the migration, orbital migration due to the disk interaction? This is another question. Now, also, do we see uh, large planets like Jupiter kind of planets in the low mass stars? These are the questions that we would like to answer. Now, the efforts in India, especially at the Physical Research Laboratory in Ahmedabad, uh, our my colleague Abhijit Chakrabarti has built a Eschel spectrograph. Eschel is basically high order uh, grating spectrograph, orders about 100 to 200. So that will give a higher resolution. And this Eschel spectrograph is now working at 1.2 meter Guru Shikhar infrared telescope in Rajasthan. And that gives you radial velocity measurements, accuracy or precision actually, less than about 2 meters per second. So this is called the PRL Advanced Fiber Fed Eschel Spectrograph for Radial Velocity Survey of Exoplanets, PARAS. We started operation in 2012 and uh, performance is uh, comparable with the best in the world like HARPS, the European, the, the Switzerland group. Now in the future, we are actually going uh, for a 2.5 meter telescope, it is underway and there will be another spectrograph built by Abhijit Chakrabarti. Uh, called Paris 2 for this larger telescope. Now this is Paris 1 for the 1.2 meter telescope. Basically what happens is from the telescope here, I hope you can see, two fibers run from the telescope. They take the light in one fiber, starlight in one fiber and a standard spectral lamp source which is a thorium argon lamp which gives you a large number of lines in this spectral region, in the visible spectral region. So these two fibers run from the telescope focus to the spectrograph over, over here. So in the spectrograph you have optics and all. So don't worry about that. We have a grating, actual grating and a cross disperser called prism, a prism, a large prism. So that will put the prism basically puts all the spectra which is coming from the uh, actual grating. It will cut and paste on the CCD nicely. I will show you the strips. That is the purpose of the cross dispersal. Now this whole chamber here in which the optics is situ situated is control, temperature control so that there won't be any temperature variations within a certain time. Temperature control to about 0 0.03 uh, degrees Celsius at 25 degrees Celsius which is the operating temperature. The pressure stability is also maintained over the night so that the atmospheric uh, fluctuations over the night will not affect the radial velocity precision. That's the idea. Now this is actual the spectrum on the CCD. You can see these cut and pasted spectra. So from the lower, uh, 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 this is about from 3000 to about uh, 8000 also it goes, okay. Angstroms, that's the coverage. Now the stability uh, of the spectrograph is very good to give the precision, the radial velocity precision of 1 to 2 meters per second for a 8th uh, or 7th uh, or 8th magnitude star. That is because the limitation is because of smaller telescope size. If you go to 2.5 meter telescope, then we expect to push this uh, stellar, uh, uh, you know, the, the faint uh, limit to about 12 or so, 11 or 12. Now, using this, Montabu spectrograph, Abhijit uh, Chakravarti and his group, they have uh, very recently discovered a sub-Saturn planet. The host star is uh, F8 or G G0 uh, dwarf star, that's the main sequence star. 
with ha having a mass of 1.1 solar mass and a radius of 1.4 solar uh, radii. And the temperature, surface temperature, effective temperature about 6000 degrees Kelvin. And the observations are here. Okay. Uh, this is a periodicity of uh, the periodicity is about 19 or 20 days. Okay. This is a Kepler uh, photometry. You can see the transit curve here. Okay. This is the model. The solid line is model. And this is the residue. That means the difference between the model and the observations. Very, very small. Okay. This is in relative flux. Okay. So one, it goes down here, goes up there. This is the radial velocity observed by the spectro para spectrograph at 1.2 meter telescope. And you can see various points here in blue with the errors here. Okay. And you can fit a nice uh, sinusoid curve here like that. So with these two together, the model has been run and these parameters have been obtained for the planet. So the mass of the planet here is 27 plus or minus 14 masses of the earth in terms of mass of the earth here. So 27 plus or minus 14 times more massive than the earth. And as you know, the Saturn mass is about 95 earth masses and the Neptune mass is 17 or 18 times the mass of the earth. So it is a, a super uh, Neptunian or a sub-Saturn exoplanet. It's more, it's probably more than, mass is probably more than or on the range of the Neptune uh, size planet, but it is much less than the Saturn size of the mass. Okay. Now the period is here, 19.49 days. The temperature of this uh, planet is estimated to be 890 degrees and the density because you know the radius also which is given here 6.1 times the radius of the earth here. So the density is 0.65 grams per cc. So compared to other planets except Saturn, the density is very low here. Saturn typically is 0 .G, 0 0.68, 0 0.68 grams per cc is Saturn density. You compare it with 5.5 grams per cc for the earth okay 1.4 grams per cc for sun 1.4 1.5 okay so this is a very low density so this is a conceptual image taken from the isro story of the week on 7th june 2018 so this is a compared to earth here this is the size of the planet discovered in this case this is a uh, this orbital size here compared to the solar system. So it's much, very much inside the, uh, in, in terms of the size, inner solar system. Now, the characterization of planets in the habitable zones is one characterization is by finding out the temperature, finding out the position where a planet can attain temperatures between 0 degrees to 100 degrees Celsius, wherein Water can exist in the form, in the form of liquid. Liquid water can exist. So if there's one of the criteria for habitability for the life sustaining planet. So if you calculate for different types of stars, A, F, G, K, M type stars, this is that strip. The yellow strip is the strip in which the temperatures of these planetary rocks, whatever, they have between 0 and 100 degrees Celsius. So the liquid water can exist in these planets. So for our solar system, it is somewhere here. This is, a, this is a mass versus distance here, radial distance. The mass of the star versus radial distance here. So the solar system planets are plotted here. So this is Mercury, Venus. Venus is just outside the habitable zone. Earth is with, well within the habitable zone. Mars is a little outside. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. So these are the things. So they are very much outside this, this definitely. Mars could have been actually a living planet. Now, 
the habitable zone actually is a time dependent these are all for the main sequence stars where you have a nice stable star the luminosity is stable but if you go to the pre main sequence star and trying to find out the habitable zone then of course it's time dependent it changes with time okay so that's the difference here so this is how you can calculate the distance in ast uh, astronomical units l star by l sun to the power of half for this kind of temperature okay let me just come to this the detection of atmospheres so another uh, important aspect is how do you detect the atmospheres around uh, the planets in a star which are orbiting around the star so the technique is in principle very simple but in practice very very difficult so this is the host star here and this is the planet which is going around that like that suppose a planet does have an atmosphere this gray area here okay so this gray ring here when it is transiting when the alignment is very nice 90 degrees inclination then the first portion of the planet that actually enters the uh, transits is the atmosphere of the planet this will enter the first so you have you now atmosphere of the planet and behind it you have a light source so you can actually observe absorption lines if the atmosphere is there as the atmosphere gases can give the absorption lines in this situation so you need a very accurate again precise uh, spectrograph and this is a very important observation this are now the scientists are now planning to do this kind of observations so that is how you can actually find out the spectra of the atmosphere now the there are what are known as biomarker or biosignature molecules by taking earth as a rosetta earth as a standard rosetta stone we need to have water vapor carbon dioxide oxygen ozone methane nitrous oxide ch3cl and such molecules and the pairs of molecules which are also important for the chemical because it's all chemical evolution is happening from the birth to to the to the time that now we are seeing the earth okay in the beginning the earth atmosphere doesn't have this all this kind of gases okay which i'll show in view graph so these are the combinations of bioactivity important pairs of molecules oxygen and methane oxygen and nitrous oxide now this is what i was telling that this is a i cannot very clearly see here that i think this is from the 3.9 uh, billion years ago to the present time here how the earth's atmosphere the gases in that earth's atmosphere have evolved in the beginning we have only the carbon dioxide methane and so on some oxygen now somewhere in between around 2 uh, billion years or so the ozone started getting developed in the beginning these all these reactions are reductive reactions that means oxygen is actually spent in the chemical reactions for instance ch4 plus o2 or o2 plus uh, uh, n2 and so on these are oxygen spending reactions so reductive reactions so if you uh, this sort of reactions now basically as you as the time is progressing to the present day we have ozone it is given by this 9 micrometer absorption here okay so ozone was not there in the earlier times and if you also see the stellar point of view this is the sun radiation here okay this is a wavelength versus the flux here you in the uv ultraviolet because for less sustainability ultraviolet is dangerous so that is happening in the earth so ultraviolet is now nicely absorbed by the ozone therefore we are surviving now so this is the earth uh, sun uh, uh, spectrum here and this is the earth spectrum in the very beginning 3.9 billion years ago this absorption in the 
far ultraviolet is done by oxygen molecule and slowly the ozone is now developing developing by chemical reactions and the present day this is the cut off here by the ozone absorption so all this ultraviolet is cut off now so we are safe this is again shown for other type of stars so which uh, i really can't see this very small here but they are from f type to uh, g type and so on several stars are also plotted here but this is this is what is happening so when you want to compare the atmospheres actually uh, the life sustaining gases and all we also should know what is the age of the star okay now these are the planetary atmospheres for different host stars for f type f0 f g2 k7 m m9 i think okay different colors here so these are the gases that you expect okay for different host stars earth like planets will give you this sort of spectra this is in the infrared this is in the visible you can see several lines this is the ozone line again okay now the closest uh, solar systems which are uh, which were discovered by anglada escuda et al and gillian et al in 2017 these are some of the latest observations even the abhijit observation is a very latest 2018 discovery uh, the important thing is that this uh, particular trappist uh, system it's the m9 very very cold star okay at about 39 light years from the sun this has Three to four Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone. So this green patch here is the habitable zone. So there are one, two, three, and probably four. These four are in the habitable zone. These are Earth-sized planets, and the entire system here we call it a, a, a some kind of a solar system. So the stellar system, entire stellar system is within. in size wise within the mercury orbit as compared to the solar system actual solar system so the whole thing is embedded in this thing here it's a cold star okay so they can survive even to at a closer distances here typically the temperatures are about 2000 2500 degrees kelvin compared to 6000 for the sun now the technical technological challenges large ground based telescopes uh, i have already mentioned so to cut the long story short photometric accuracies we need micro magnitudes spectroscopic accuracies in centimeters per second long baseline may help achieve the micro arc second to reach micro arc second and transit spectroscopy of exoplanets so in summary planets are frequent several earth sized planets have been discovered so and multiple planetary systems are discovered also so ex exo solar systems basically at the type environment claims of discovery in the habitable zone this have to be confirmed again there have been cases several cases low mass stars do not seem to have jupiter sized gas giants but more observations are required formation mechanisms is probably core accretion okay and characterization of planets mass and radius both are required therefore all the transit observations have to be followed up by the radial velocity observations so the paras like instruments are very much in business and probing of the atmospheres of exoplanets that is another technological challenge now i have given some additional reference material an astronomy and astrophysics yesterday someone asked so these are some of these books here now before i start answering the questions i will uh, thank all the participants for uh, your attention